Welcome to the Success in Entrepreneurship and Life podcast. I'm your host, Nick Ahrens. Today we've got on Dennis Simsek, otherwise known as the Anxiety Guy. We really take a deep dive into the conscious and subconscious mind here and how to take control of your emotions and how to take control of your conscious mind by rewiring your brain and rewiring a lot of your emotions. A lot of this information is extraordinarily powerful and I've started to actually implement a lot of it into my daily routines. Hopefully you learn as much as I did from this. So welcome everybody. Today we've got on uh, Dennis Simsek. How's it going, Dennis? It's going really well, my friend. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. Absolutely. Thank you for making time out of your out of your morning routine here. I know you're eating breakfast down there in Bali. I'm breakfast, lost. tea, everything organic, everything natural. <laughs> it comes straight to your door, so it's kind of spoiled here, I can tell you. Hey, so so give everybody a little bit of background about who you are and kind of who you were as a kid and how you grew up. Sure. Um I go mainly uh, the the thing that people tend to gear towards most is my podcast. So I've got a podcast out on iTunes as well as Podbean and such named the Anxiety Guy podcast, which is directly targeted towards people suffering from anxiety, panic disorder, um, other mental, emotional challenges. And um, and more so, it's a combination of my own experience, the people I work with and science, facts, figures. I try not to provide people anything that's not real science or anything like that. So the podcast does very well. Along with that, I've got a YouTube channel, again, focused on helping people with anxiety. And lately, it's been there's been a massive amount of people coming to the YouTube channel based around health anxiety. So hypochondria has been a very, very popular um, area and I get a lot of questions around the ideas of Dennis. Are you sure my symptoms and my sensations are in fact related to anxiety, or is it? Could it be something more serious than that? Yeah. So. So yeah. So it sounds like a lot of people who approach you don't really know what anxiety is. For you know, I, there is a lot of that, and then there's a lot of people out there that know a ton about anxiety, but are just not creating any progress in their lives. Um, I get both ends of the spectrum. I get the ones that uh, are just newly introduced to it. Say, you know, they've gone to the doctors, they've got a diagnosis. You have an anxiety disorder, and spe- more specifically, it's related to panic, or more specifically, it's related to agoraphobia or something like that. So they'll get the diagnosis, and they'll start searching on YouTube. They'll start searching podcasts, and they'll find my website. And, uh, and next thing you know, the name, the anxiety guy, and this guy must know a couple of things. So if he calls himself that, so that shows up. And next thing you know, you know, they're able to relate. And that's probably the most important part out of anything. I build trust with people very quickly. I build a bond. I build a rapport with them. They can talk to me. And it's a lot different than going to your local therapist or your counselor who, mm-hmm. Again, you know, you might not have the kind of rapport that you need to get the results that you need. So all of a sudden they view a video and they say, wow, this guy really does know his stuff and he's been in my shoes. Maybe he can help me. So I'm seeing both ends of the spectrum to tell you the truth. I've been doing a lot of personal development over the last about five or eight years now. And it's kind of a topic that comes up a lot. So that's how I actually came across you was your podcast and listened to a handful of episodes and went, wow, this guy's this guy's good. Right. Um, uh, to tell you the truth, yeah, mm-hmm. sorry. I'll just go my, my background just a little yeah. bit. Um, you know, it, a lot of people think that their anxiety, in fact, started very recently when, in fact, if you start peeling the onion and you get to the core of it all, you'll notice that much of it started between uh, the ages of 0 and 10 or 0 and 7, very, very young. Um, patterns that were developed, you know, being hypnotized by others, other people's behaviors, words, thoughts, that sort of thing, emulating their authority figures like mom and dad. So a lot of it, you know, even for me, I didn't really recognize it until I started to dig deep. And I said, my God, this stuff started really, really early. I don't, I'd never even realized. I, all I thought was I had the panic attack a few years ago and I turned into this hypochondriac or whatever it was. But in fact, it started very early. So, um, yeah, that just kind of progressed into the high school years and I had a lot of freedom there. And once 
the age of 25, 26 came around. Next thing you know, I was highly, highly sensitized to the world, people, situations, environments, you name it. And there wasn't much in the world or places in the world or people that created any kind of a neutral emotion around me. So I found myself very, very um, scared about everything. Interesting. So it that's actually something you commented on here is one of the things I really picked up from an episode of your podcast, which was uh, you said some being influenced or hypnotized by the other people directly around us in our lives. And I think a lot of people out there don't realize that it comes kind of comes back to that classic saying we are the average of the five closest people to us. Mm. And I, I think a lot of people don't really understand that. Does that kind of hold true for uh, your experiences and a lot of a lot of the people you're helping? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've noticed a ton of um, patterns and build up within people where unconscious because you know everybody thinks you know in today's world you talk about beliefs and people say you got to change your beliefs you got to change the way you think and such. The problem is, is that even in, you know, I'm guessing in the real estate industry and sales and such like that, there is always a conflict between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. There's always that conflict between the two. You got probably the best salesman on the planet who's got the best talent in the world. Um, you know, he's incredible at what he does. He studies really hard. He's very driven. He's got a good vision. But in the back of his mind, in the unconscious mind, there's a couple of really deeply embedded ingrained beliefs that say you can't or you never could or your mom couldn't or your dad couldn't and because those are there this person will always sabotage themselves no matter how hard they work or no matter you know who they meet or anything like that so the other thing is is that yes the five people that you hang around with the most becomes who you are because we are all if you see us it's it's like this energetic being it's like if you see yourself as a magnet or a vibration or something like that um, you are always emanating a certain frequency and the truth is that our subconscious mind picks up on people's energy you don't even need to say anything so if me and you are hanging out for an hour and we rarely speak we'll have a good idea of how you are and how I am and such and whichever emotion is more heightened between us will win the day so i will turn into you or you will turn into me um, based around are you feeling more depressed or more sad or are you feeling in a negative way more emotional are you feeling more positive way more emotional depending on that you will win the day so it's very important to understand if there's any toxicity in your life as far as people goes or foods go or anything like that. These are constantly making up your own vibration. These are making up your thoughts. These are making up, you know, which thoughts and beliefs you entertain and which ones you don't. So it, it, you nailed it right there. It, it's very important that we understand that the people that are around us, as much as we feel like they're not influencing us, they are every moment that we're around them whether you're speaking or not, because speaking is just one way of communicating, one language, and there are many, many different types of language. Now, does does that also go for other things that are impacting our lives? Like, if we go on, you screw around on YouTube for a couple hours and watch some videos, or watch TV for a while, or we listen to morning shows, morning radio shows, where it's all kind of artificial drama that's that's being created and presented to us is that also affecting us in the same way absolutely i mean that's creating the makeup of your identity pretty much so wherever your time is being spent the most is is, is creating your character is aligning you with those very things that you're recognizing many many times we will be watching something or we will be hearing something our conscious mind will never be there. You know, it'll be on the background. Like the news is on. I'm kind of paying attention to it, but I'm really not. I'm more worried about what happened earlier today or what's going to happen tomorrow. Rarely are we ever really present. So we may be watching something. We may be with someone. But the truth is, is that we live in a society where we're so in our minds. We're so caught up in our thinking. We're so caught up in what happened and what's going to happen that we rarely take the time to recognize what's around us, 
um, to recognize what we have, which is in fact the very thing we wanted five years ago. Mm-hmm. And we are constantly searching for the next thing that's going to create fear and drama within us. So anxiety, the numbers are blowing up. They're, you know, they're going crazy right now. And people have no idea where it happened, how it happened, and, and what to do about it. Well, and unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of um, kind of drama in, I don't, I don't know how to phrase this the right way, but a lot of kind of uh, BS drama type stuff is being promoted and heavily viewed on not only social media, but also through reality TV, also mm-hmm. projected through the radio. And then I think we pick up on that just like, I mean, you're, you're the expert here, but it's kind of like how a little kid can pick up on all the little subtle cues of a parent. Mm. And I, I, I think kids pick up on all of that stuff. And I don't know about you, but I had a lot of memories of being little, articulating what I'm trying to say in my head to my parents, mm-hmm. but I couldn't quite speak. I only had a handful of words I could use at the time. Mm-hmm. But I was, and I think everybody's kind of like this, we recognize that. And we study it and we watch it and it all affects us and it's all part of our environment and all comes in and it's absolutely not, but it's not easy to get out of those habits because a lot of people yeah. are going to say who are listening to this well i like watching um one of the housewives shows or i mm-hmm. like watching this this other tv show or whatever it may be mm-hmm. uh what would you say kind of in response to that you know, it's uh, it's really interesting because the, your unconscious mind doesn't really care what information you feed it. So if I'm watching Spider-Man on TV, um, you know, my system believes that I am Spider-Man. I'm jumping from one building to the other, and there's a lot of excitement there. There's a lot of stimulation. You'll notice that people get so caught up in the movies because your system believes that you are, in fact, the character in that movie, which is a problem. Because now um, you're creating pairings, you're creating associations. These, the movies, the CNNs, the news, the this, the that, all that sort of stuff that you're watching, all the music that you're feeding your mind, all the lyrics that you're hearing on a daily basis, they are all making up the, the thoughts that you entertain the most throughout the day. So... I may be going through the day and I wake up in the morning, I'm feeling pretty good. And all of a sudden a fearful thought shows up, you know, uh, I'm going to go meet Tom today. Um, but I'm kind of hazy about it because he might criticize me or whatever it may be, or criticize my work. All of a sudden I'm now attracted and attached to fear and drama in my day. And I give more priority to the thoughts that are in line with fear, drama, anxiety, anything that might be a threat to me. And it doesn't have to be a threat to my life. It just has to be a threat to my, you know, my social world, a threat to my career, a threat to my, you know, whatever it may be. So we're going through each and every day of our lives looking for threats. We're looking for threats and we're not, we don't have the same threats we did before as far as saber tooth tigers goes and such like that, but we still have the same build, build up in our brains called the fight or flight response. And because this is there, um, anything could potentially be a threat. This cup that I'm holding right here, you know, if I had a panic attack and I was drinking out of this cup at the same time I had that build up of panic and whatever, I will create a pairing and association to the cup. Next thing you know, I've also created a pairing association to what's in the cup and the smell and the color. So Mm -hmm. what the unconscious mind does is it groups everything, all that information and says, that is wrong. That is a threat. So therefore, every time I'm around this cup, I may not even know it, but I start to feel anxious. I start to feel panicky. I start to feel these icky feelings in my body. And next thing you know, the thoughts arise and I give priority to those thoughts because of how I feel. I want to change how I feel. So the, the cycle begins and the cycle continues day after day for anxiety sufferers constantly. Yeah, well, that sounds like a lot like the NLP term anchoring. We, somebody has a panic attack and that series and sequence of emotions was anchored to that cup and that whatever it is you're drinking out of there, coffee or tea whatever, or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. 
it's kind of the same idea that when you know we get um, we get in a little bit of a back and forth with somebody who's close to us, we have an, a whole ritual anchored sequence of thoughts, and I've got my argument, and they've got their argument, and it doesn't matter what we're talking about, we end up going down the exact same paths. Exactly. Every single and, time, but, and the end result's exactly the same every time. But it's so exactly. damn hard to break out of that ritual. <laughs> and it's possible. Um, as you know, when you start thinking things consciously, you know, your subconscious has already made a decision over what's in your environment, who you're talking to, way before your conscious mind even has a chance to figure things out. I mean, it's uh, the decisions are already made. That person's wrong. That environment's bad. You know, that book is good. But, you know, all these pairings, these associations are meant so that we don't have to learn the same lesson over and over and over again. So by pairing these things up and creating these associations, I now have a guide, a tool, a toolbox as I go through life. The problem is, is the majority of the things in the outside world that we unconsciously pair up with being a threat is in fact nothing. It's neutral. But yeah. we don't take, you know, the, I'm going to say the majority of the world doesn't take the time or put in the effort to consciously think their ways through difficult or challenging situations well and it's, it's like it's never their fault yeah. though is it in a way it is because <laughs> you know in a way it's not the 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 pairing isn't so much their fault but i've always said this that anxiety is not your uh, is you're not to blame for your anxiety the majority of your anxiety you are not to blame but it is your responsibility to get better and to change those pairings so, yeah. Yeah, that kind of brought me to something I just wrote down here, which is how would somebody go about resetting those pairings or that, that anchored emotion to a location or an item or a person? Mm -hmm. there's, there's many different ways to be able to change these core beliefs and these pairings and such. Um, but it's got to be a combination of working with the subconscious mind, but also the conscious mind. It's almost like they're dancing. You know, they're at a dance club and they're holding each other and it's a slow dance and one keeps stepping on the toes of the other. And next thing you know, there's going to be a lot of conflict there. So it's got to be, in my opinion, it's got to be a combination of what you do to speak the language of the subconscious mind. There's a specific language there. And the conscious mind, to have enough self-awareness and consciousness throughout the day to recognize when you're going in the direction of, you know, these limiting ways of seeing things. Yeah. Subconsciously, it's, it comes down to my favorite, and you've got to be doing it right, and you've got to take the time to learn how to do it. It comes down to things related to visualization exercises. Visualization exercises, I'll get people to close their eyes. I'll put them in a semi-trance state and I'll get them to start moving pictures around, not in their minds, but also in the external world because, you know, we're working with this energy field that we all have. So I'll tell them, you know, uh, what's the picture, you know, connect it to a part in your body and so forth. So I'll get them to shift the way they see things based on a language that the unconscious mind understands. So pictures, internal images are very, very important. Visualization. Hypnosis is excellent. Um, meditation is obviously, we're again, we're tapping into our unconscious mind because we put our brainwave states into what's called a theta. When you're in a theta, your unconscious mind is more open to these suggestions, which is fantastic for, for positive change. So there is the unconscious ways of doing things to tap into that language. And along with that, you know, since our unconscious mind understands two things, images and feelings, we've got to create the emotions throughout the day that we want. So I've got to make sure that I feel good. People always wait for things to make them feel good when, in fact, the language of your unconscious is to is, is it understands emotions. It understands feelings. So you've got to consciously take time to do things that make you feel good throughout the day. Oxytocin is a, is, a, is a neurotransmitter that um, creates rapid change within your system much faster if it's you know, being engaged and embraced in your system at a quicker speed. So the more oxytocin you have in your system, the faster you're going to change. Orgasms. 
number one, right? Oxytocin, dark chocolate, <laughs> um, smiling, <laughs> laughter. Yep. You know, these sorts of things will help the process to get you there. Yeah. So, yeah, we're talking about the unconscious, but we're also talking about the conscious where you're going through the day and you get that icky thought. And the ability for you to counterstatement those thoughts or counter question those are very, very important. So it's a combination of working with what the unconscious mind understands and to be self-aware and what's going on through throughout the day. Yeah, and it's well, it's not easy to be self-aware. When I first started reading about meditation, I went, all this kind of recurring thing, theme came up of, watch your thoughts and i went how do i watch my thoughts thoughts are mm. thoughts are kind of auditory within my own head i can't mm. see them in front of me so how does that work mm. and it plus you get like oh, about a hundred thousand of them every single day so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly and, and it was really tough for me to figure out how to just kind of observe and listen to my thoughts and just mm. Just watch them objectively. It's not good or bad of what they are. But it was it was really awakening. It was really eye-opening to me to start to do that. And mm. coming back to what you were talking about, about meditation, it's what's really interesting is when I, I'm fairly new at meditation um, and I absolutely love it. But when I finish meditating, I don't have as many thoughts in my head However, the quality and clarity of them are on a way, way higher level. Level, mm -hmm. I can think mm -hmm. through problems extra extraordinarily quickly mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. having to deal with all the excess logic and all the other potential routes that may not have worked for mm -hmm. as a solution for whatever an issue it is I'm trying to tackle. Absolutely. The solution just seems to kind of appear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean... At this point, you're through deep meditation and through works around unconscious minds and, and getting your emotions to a good place, uh, you're actually tapping into a part of your mind that's called the superconscious mind. The superconscious mind is where you where you intuitively just know. You just know. I mean, I could be going through the day and I get an icky feeling and I know that I want to run from that burning building. But in fact, I know that I'm going to be OK in that burning building if I place myself um, in a situation that is challenging. There's this intuitiveness. There's this idea that, you know, I'm thinking these things. And yes, they are the right way to think about the situation. This is the right thing to do in this situation. And so many people talk about it in different ways. They say, oh, I reached you know, the fifth dimension or whatever it may be. I got to a higher place. I tapped into my higher intelligence, whatever it may be. But overall, it, it all comes down to clarity. You're just so much more clear because you've taken the time out. You've given back to yourself. You, you've done something that your system can once and for all reboot and refresh. And therefore, you start to see things and perceive things a lot differently. And that's a good example, what you just mentioned there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting. I have started to recommend med meditation to everyone I know, or at least some sort of self-awareness or observance of, of their own thoughts. Mm. And it's, it's really, really interesting. And like I said, I'm, I'm quite a layman at, this, at the whole thing. And at the same time, I'm a huge believer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, of, does, it takes a bit of convincing and in the beginning if you know nothing about it. But uh, and as well, you know, if you've got anxiety, the, the most difficult thing is to meditate. You know, there's people out there that say, Dennis, I've got a lot. I've got all this anxiety. I got my fight or flight response going on high drive all day. And you expect me to sit with my breath and to not focus in on these. Th I mean, this is it's almost impossible for people starting off. But the idea is that, like exactly like you mentioned, the idea is to become more of an observer rather than a reactor. When you can get to a place where you observe your thoughts and you observe your bodily sensations and you observe these things, then you can begin to pick them apart and to see through them and notice how they're not helping. When you notice how they're not helping, you can only then tap into the opposite of that thought, the opposite of that belief, which is in fact, wow. I don't have to see everything from this point of view. I can, in fact, view things from this point of view, which was never available to me before meditation. 
So it's it's very it's it's such an incredible tool and you can do it any time and you don't have to be in a corner in a zen room meditating i meditate when i walk i meditate when i you know when i'm doing other things i meditate all the time i'm you know people will look at me and they'll go my god that guy looks like he's in a bit of a trance but in fact i'm just so grateful for the moment i'm practicing what i know is right so Absolutely. Absolutely. If you haven't started meditation, I would truly suggest that you get into it and start learning about it, just like you're um, bringing out to the people around you. Mm -hmm. It's one thing. um, I started learning about NLP for a while. Mm -hmm. And there was a, I forget who it was, but they were saying, this guy would always bet on boxing. And Mm -hmm. when, when uh, when they were meeting in the middle of the ring, Whoever looked the most zenned out and out of it and out of touch with what was going on in their surroundings, that guy was in the deepest trance state, slowing time down in his mind more than the other guy. He was going to win the fight. Mm. And that kind of holds true to like basketball players. The NBA championships were just on a, what about a month ago. Mm-hmm. And there's always, when guys are on fire, there's kind of this glossed over look in their eyes. Mm-hmm. Like they're not quite here in this in this reality, that in this state mm-hmm. of consciousness that most everybody else is. Baseball players, same thing. When they Brilliant. step into the batter's box and they look zonked out, mm-hmm. they're probably gonna connect the bat to the ball. Mm-hmm. And if they're not and they're stressed, they're probably not. They're probably gonna swing and miss. And it, it holds true almost every single time. Absolutely. I mean, you get to a place where you're just so controlled over the situations. I mean, you'll see Michael Jordan, you'll see Roger Federer on the tennis court. I've seen this constantly over and over again, where they don't even realize that the game is over. They don't even know the score. Michael Jordan said he never looked at the scoreboard. It's And so he's so caught up in staying in a certain vibration that he knows if he does those things correctly and if he stays in that place for long enough, the score will take care of itself. You know, he doesn't have, and, and that's the opposite of, you know, you got to be perfect. You got to get out there and win. I was a tennis professional for a long time and the message to me was win, win, win. You got to go out and do everything you can to win. It doesn't matter if, even if you cheat to win, you got to win. Mm-hmm. So that will create a ton of you know, emotion within you. And next thing you know, when the score gets tight, you will be the one that suffers rather than the other person who's much more neutral in the situation and views it as if they've just started the match or the game or whatever it may be. So again, you know, meditation, hypnosis, visualization, all of these things bring you back to the present moment. And therefore situations that most people find challenging and, and difficult to take care of become, more so a neutral situation. And that's the, the, the difference that separates anxiety recovers from anxiety suffers, separates Michael Jordan from the guy sitting on the bench or whatever it may be, better from everybody else. I truly believe that it's not so much the skills or the talent or the, the amount of repetition they did, but it's their ability to be in that moment and to be neutral emotionally. Yeah, I think so as well. It, and I think everybody can do that in every situation in their lives whether it's calling their boss that to have an uncomfortable conversation or uh, even just meeting friends out for dinner changing Mm -hmm. their state to be able to create whatever they want to in -hmm. that moment is not something easy to learn to do but I think every single person can learn that skill Mm -hmm. and And, and uh, should utilize that should you absolutely and the the key words that you mentioned there was change your state uh changing your emotional state doesn't only mean changing the thoughts that you entertain and 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 what's going on in your mind but changing your state has a lot to do with something that we rarely talked about or were told as a young child and that's to change your body you know rarely do we ever recognize um that our physiology, in fact, takes care of our psychology. They, you know, the mind and the body are not separate. They are one. So if I can then hold a certain posture, if I can then hold a certain speed in which I do things, where I slow things down, all of a sudden the priority I give 
on which thought I entertain and which thoughts I don't will change. Because if I'm doing things very, very quickly, I will entertain thoughts based around fear and challenges and the worst possible scenarios, most likely. If I look a certain way and I'm hunched over and my chin's down and such, I will entertain thoughts that are in line with what I don't want. I don't want to feel bad. I don't want things to go bad externally. So breathing your breathing patterns play a massive role in the thoughts that you entertain and the ones that you don't. Your posture plays a massive role, and your speed plays a massive role. And when I work with people, I not only work with the unconscious, the conscious thoughts that they entertain and the ones that they don't, but it's very important to understand how you use your body in any given situation. I mean, just look at the, the greatest athletes today, look at Ronaldo. You guy steps on the field and he's, he's already won. You know, there's 11 people on the other side of the field going, holy crap, Ronaldo's on the field. <laughs> he just yeah. looks different. And just because of that, you know, he's given out a certain language. That's, again, a certain language. Federer walks on the tennis court. The guy already thinks he doesn't have a chance. I mean, you see these athletes. You see these Anthony Robbins. You see these... Uh, Richard Bandler's you see these guys who are very successful in their craft and you'll notice a similarity between all of them They've trained and conditioned themselves through their physiology and therefore their psychology reacts to what they do with their body So it's very important to to gauge both is to work on both Yeah, absolutely one thing I uh, I used to coach youth sports. I used to coach water polo and I would always do this little test with everybody I said alright guys I want you to try something because I, I tried to bring a lot of some of these concepts into it to help help grow everybody as much as I could as well outside of the actual technical skill involved in the sport mm. and I wanted, I'd have them all stand up like alright everybody's gonna stick their chest out a little bit pull the shoulders back stick their hands in the sky lean back and smile and with that mm. huge giant grin mm -hmm. try to feel terrible Ah. Or, or while you're in that physiological state, you guys can't see this, but Dennis is actually laughing at me right now because I'm doing this <laughs> in my chair. <laughs> I love it. I love um, it. But while, while you're doing that, try to think of a bad thought. Mm. And it doesn't work. It mm. simply doesn't work. And I think you're spot on in saying that there's a pairing between physiology and psychology. You're you're a hundred percent on it. Uh, what are some other kind of tools and techniques along those lines that people could use? You know, the the tools and techniques are basically never ending. There's always another technique out there, something that comes up. You know, um, on a daily basis, I find more and more of these different types of techniques that show up. Um, the problem isn't so much the techniques more than anything. The differences between the, I'll go back to the technique part in a second, but this is important. The difference between the non-successful and the successful, and we're talking about anxiety sufferers, anxiety recovers, victims, warriors, athletes, non-athletes, whatever it may be. The difference more than anything is I find that when they search for the quick fixes, when they see a technique and they're involved in a technique and it doesn't work right away, a lot of them tend to judge and label the technique as being bad or wrong or they're not good enough or anything like that. The difference between these two people is that one will take the technique and say, I've got to embrace and commit to this technique for the next 21 days to three months if I truly want change to happen based around what my life has been like. I've practiced all these ways, consciously and unconsciously, these different techniques in my entire life. I've set these, I've ingrained these, and all of a sudden, I'm bringing out this whamby-pamby technique, this little thing that I've never tried before, and my unconscious mind has no familiarity around it, and I expect that to work over all this other stuff I've practiced. I mean, if you think about it, it's not logical. It makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. But people don't think logically today. OK, they think that a technique or a tool done a handful of times should, in fact, shift their entire emotional state. And that's the wrong mindset. The difference between these people is that, you know, they can they understand that the techniques 
the strategies, the detoxifying process, all of those things are building up their character. It's like a molding process. It's going to take me this amount of time because it's taken me this amount of time to get anxious. Mm -hmm. I understand. So the mindset is so, so critical from going from, you know, this has got to work right now to this is going to work in time. So, you know, it's and I realized that this was most likely the most important part of my recovery was to start seeing what I was implementing differently. So you think there's but, a kind of a slow buildup of it and that ends up affecting the personality in a in a very substantial uh, long lasting way. Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing is that when the technique works right away, a lot of times the next day will be different. You'll start to feel uh, down on yourself. You might feel more anxious. You might feel more panicky. You know, you're not, and, and all of a sudden the technique that worked yesterday, you know, you label it as being wrong today. And the problem there is that the unconscious mind isn't very easily convinced. So, Repetition is the mother of all skill. I believe someone said that before. And so because that's the case, it's going to take time before you actually um, automate the process and get to a place of unconscious competence where you do it automatically. And people need to realize this more than anything before you start the strategy, before you start the program, before you start the technique. Understand that this is a journey towards your purpose and mission. You are meant to go through this process. You are meant to mold yourself in this way because it's bringing you to a place of further clarity, to be better in your career, to start that business, to contribute to other people, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So the mindset is truly, truly important. But as far as techniques go, um, you know, there are multiple techniques out there that we can use and Mainly what I like to do is have techniques based around what do you do in the moment of the challenge? So in the moment of being challenged, someone goes to the mall and upon getting to the door of that mall, they start to feel icky. They start to have these reflexive, repetitive thoughts in their mind saying, don't go there. Don't you remember what happened last time? It's in the moment, it's in that exact moment where your unconscious mind is taking notes to see what you're going to do and how you're going to react. And if you keep doing what you've normally done, you're going to keep feeling the way you normally feel. So I could go to that door and all of a sudden I could be really hazy about it. I could question my abilities. I could notice how my self-worth is so low. I don't deserve to feel good in this mall, whatever it may be. Or I could view the situation as our brains are so live wired. So in the moment, this is the moment. This is my exact moment. This is my glory moment. I could be a hero right in this moment and change my life if I just recognize it as an opportunity, an opportunity to shift what I've ingrained into my mind and body for so long. So I view the mall as a challenge. OK, so I'm moving into the mall. I'm looking around and I'm getting really familiarized with what's around. Oh, that construction over there. It's finally done. Oh, the food courts over there. Oh, my favorite shops over there. I can't wait to buy those shoes that I always wanted and such. And I begin to practice. All I begin to do is practice and I bring along the feelings as a companion. So those icky feelings, come on. It's like walking the dog, right? Yeah. And again, you mentioned meditation. If the meditation and what I call mapping, where you identify different body parts and without labeling them you you move with them you observe them this is the same scenario as the mall as the social gathering as the whatever makes you feel anxious so i found i find that when people have this big success they get to the mall they shift their mindset about the mall they start to bring their anxious feelings as companions with them. They start to counter the original thoughts with thoughts that make more sense and are more rational in that moment. When they begin to do these things, a lot of times the first 10 minutes of the mall is very, very difficult. But then things start to subside and you start to get to a more neutral place. All of a sudden, the mall, the perception of the mall has shifted completely. So it's in those 10 minutes, the 10 minutes that you're in that situation, that place, or the time that normally makes you feel anxious, that you have the opportunity to shift and change 
um, your overall conditioning and your programming. So we've got to begin viewing it differently. Yeah. I, I really like, again, you brought up the idea of pairing that subconscious mind with the different emotions and where we are to really kind of create that state to go from a state of anxiety to a more neutral state. It was kind of interesting you didn't mention to a a really positive, joyful, like over the moon type of state in, in your mall example. Yeah, I mean, you can easily get to a place of being excited about the mall rather than being anxious about the mall, depending on where your focus goes, depending on where your if my focus goes internally, then there's going to be a problem. Because now I'm concerned over my heart rate. I'm concerned over my the feeling in my head and my chest area. I'm overly internal, and therefore I shut out everything external. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. And there's got to be a balance between the two, okay, in the beginning stages. There's got to be this step-by-step, -step, systematic way of starting to pull your attention to the things that make you feel more neutral to being more excited, in the outside world. So at the mall, I could be, you know, oh, Joe's sitting over there. Maybe I'll talk to him later on. You know, oh, they got a new uh, ride over there. You know, whatever it may be. But this is, again, the conditioning aspect of things. This is where you practice. And I say this to everybody that I work with. I say, every anxious moment is an opportunity to practice. That's it. And if you can view it in that manner, then the skills and techniques will be much more powerful than if you didn't view it in that manner. Wow, I think what you just said is huge. And I, I think it goes for everybody throughout their whole lives. When, when we start to feel that anxiety, it's, it's an opportunity to, to learn and to grow when we feel that. Grow. I know one of, the t one of the types of situations where I really start to feel anxiety in my business is when I start cold calling a bunch of people in a row. I just don't like it. I don't look forward to it. And I, it's hard for me to go from number to number to number. Mm. And have, have all those people I know are most likely going to hang up on me. Okay. Um, what do you like about it? What do I like about it? It, it creates opportunity for new business. Mm. And it, it does work. The numbers are there because we do track and, and follow mm how many time how many people we call versus how many contacts we have versus how many mm. appointments we end up getting and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we track it all from there but it's it's ne it's not fun for me to do and it's not something that comes naturally oh no it's not it's, it's not natural to start feeling good about something that you normally feel bad about it's, it's it takes and that's where the pain is because too many people today are so caught up and we're programmed this way caught up in trying to find the quick fix and if it's not there then we revert back to what's been conditioned right and sadness depression anxiety running rampant in many many countries today mm -hmm. so the pain of putting in the effort the pain of being conscious the pain of it taking too long the pain of it you know of what's going to happen when i in fact get better this is all pain and, and a lot of people connect too much pain to changing and therefore, they never take the time to change. But in just 30 seconds there, as you began focusing on the parts that you enjoy about cold calling, all of a sudden, there was an emotional shift there, was there not? Oh, yeah, there was. And I kind of caught you with a big grin on your face and went, bingo, that's it right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, and we, we are just, it, we're just so focused on one way of seeing something and doing something that we don't even recognize that there's another way to see it. And that's the problem with generalized anxiety today. Yeah. Um, someone will wake up in eight in the eight a.m. and they'll go to work. They got to meet their boss. They got to deal with the coworkers and this and that. And they got to hide their symptoms from people. Okay, well, you know, we understand all of that. But what what is the job or the career actually giving you and your family? You know, if you start to begin to shift your focus from seeing it from one way to another, all of a sudden your emotions will shift. And the way you perceive your boss and your coworkers and your workspace and such will change as well. So it's so, so important to take control of your focus. And it takes time and it takes practice before it becomes the new default mode. But once it becomes the new default mode, then not only will your, will your emotions 
change, but your career will change. Uh, your relationships will change. Um, the way you spend your leisure time will change. Everything will change based on um, where your focus is going. So once that becomes the default, you know, you're limitless, basically. You're limitless. And I've, I'm saying this because I've experienced it firsthand. Yeah. I've, I've gone through it. I mean, my life changed in, in, a, in, a, in the two years when, in fact, I was a slave to the system. I was a slave to my mind. I was a slave to my emotions for so long. I allowed my emotions to do the thinking for me rather than my thinking leading my emotions. So if I can do this, you know, anybody can do it. It's just a matter of following the information that you know is going to work, giving it time, and really seeing every anxious moment as an opportunity to practice. Truly the, truly the case. That's awesome. I heard on – I was listening to the Ed Milet podcast um, this morning, and he had somebody on who was saying – that about 80% of our thoughts throughout the day are the exact same thoughts repeating themselves again and again and again and again. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Which was kind of fascinating to me that there's that, the subconscious is just spewing out kind of the same thing into our conscious mind on, re on repeat, on loop, again and again and again and again and again. So it sounds like it'd be very difficult to start that process of changing it. If we try to, if we try to be aware of it, like one yeah. or two times throughout the day, and mm -hmm. then three thousand more times we have that other original thought, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of time to start changing those numbers and those percentages. Mm -hmm. it's, it, that's really interesting you say that because um, in my life now the eighty percent of thoughts are so different than the eighty percent of thoughts that were there say ten years ago. It's, it's made a complete switch. Um, and it's really interesting how I can perceive things much differently now and how other people who've gotten to a much better place in their lives can, can say the same thing for themselves. But with all of these thoughts, it can be so, so um, demoralizing and difficult to say that I'm going to now, at this point in my life, start focusing on what thoughts I entertain the most and which ones I don't. And so, you know, it can be really, really difficult in the beginning stages. So you want to start with the thoughts that you entertain the most and that show up the most. Which thoughts are you really, you know, spending a lot of time with? Which one's the most? For me, it was the idea that um, this sensation was one day, you know, in the near future is going to kill me. So I was always very sensitized to every sensation that showed up. And so I started to become aware of when that thought showed up. And when that thought showed up, I began to uh, move towards the evidence rather than the illusions that I was creating. So what evidence is there that supports this irrational way of seeing my sensations? Great question. Um, you know, I've got doctor's notes on the fridge that say I'm healthy. I've got people around me that say my skin color and my vibe and everything else is really, really good. I have other people that tell me I'm a hypochondriac and I'm not um, someone who lives with a physical ailment. There's so much evidence that I need to start focusing on that evidence and get away from my delusions, my my irrational ways of seeing those things. So mm -hmm. it's just, you know, take the, the start, with, start with just one, right? And you'll notice that as that one starts to flip around and switch around, that the next one becomes easier and easier and easier and easier. Conscious competence starts to uh, dictate your life. The next thing you know, it's like walking. You just reverse everything. Yeah. Is, is that kind of how something like a morning routine work or a set of daily affirmations would work to get us kind of into that state and then repeat it every day for months and months and months and months? You know, my affirmations are, you know, at this point in my life, having been practiced so much, they don't need any more conscious attention. I mean, they are just there. So you get to a place where in the beginning it starts as a, as a morning routine and then later on in your life, it just becomes something that you do. It's like driving or anything like that. I, 
I can't imagine myself not going through the two or three things that I do each and every morning from now on because it's like eating. It's like walking. It's like driving. It's just a part of my life. That's why words such as diet, um, I don't like that word because I see, you know, the eating, the, the missing link to anxiety, the whole nutrition game as being a lifestyle. This is a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, your habits, these new habits are a lifestyle. Your eating patterns are a lifestyle. The people that you hang around with and the, the, the comments and the feedback that you get from those people, your ability to accept and reject that information is a lifestyle. This is a lifestyle. So people need to see that their desires and their core beliefs must begin to match now. I really want this thing. I really want to feel this way. But there are core beliefs based around your habits that are not allowing you to get your desires and therefore your self-worth and your self-esteem pays the price. So to connect those things, self-awareness, consciousness, and the ability for you to end the repetitive mistakes that you're constantly making in those moments of being challenged is the key to all of it, right? Yeah. So uh, how important is it to rephrase the words we tell ourselves in our head? Crucial. It's absolutely crucial because the thoughts that you entertain the most will lead to the emotions. Your emotions will lead to lead to your behaviors. Your behaviors will lead towards the actions that you take consistently and your actions will create the results in your life. There is a certain cycle there. So if I go all the way back to the beginning and I, and I get to a place where I accept this thought based around the facts and the science and the figures behind it, and I reject this thought because it's a delusion and it's an illusion and I'm just creating something out of nothing, now the whole cycle changes, which means that my reality changes in the end. So it, it really does come down to the fact that you, your inner critical voices that are not you, but are in fact your mom and your dad and your brother and your coaches and your teachers, those are the voices that are playing out in your mind. It's not your voices, but a lot of people think it's your voice. It's your own voice. It's the truth. Your thoughts are not the truth. Your thoughts are just the starting position that you need to either accept or reject based around what you truly want in your life. When you can begin to separate the these two ways of thinking about something then now you're going to become aligned you're aligned you're vibrationally aligned with your desires and once you're vibrationally aligned with what you want what you want will manifest quicker um, than you've ever believed it could but alignment before action Before you go and start taking all this action, you've got to be aligned with what you truly want, which means you've got to scrape out your core beliefs. You've got to begin to become more conscious and self-aware on a daily basis of what's right and what's wrong, what's true for you and what's not true. And therefore, you need to put in the work. You need to put in the conscious work to, to separate those things in your life because that will in turn get you what you want or keep it farther away from you. And the other thing is, is that has anybody ever told you that you look like Cristiano Ronaldo? <laughs> um, <laughs> about three people this week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that. Wow. Uh, I just realized that. That's hilarious. Um, ID. You need to walk around and show everybody, hey, look at me. <laughs> there's, a, there's a sushi place my wife and I go to, and every time I go in there, they go, hey, Ronaldo, how's it going? Uh-huh. Oh, I could see that. I so, see geez, that. turn and hide, turn and hide. <laughs> <laughs> um, coming back to what you were just saying, that kind of reminds me of something I've heard a lot of times from a lot of people, which is be, do, have. We've got to, in order to have the life and have the things we want, we have to be doing the things to get us there. And in order to be doing the things to get us there, we have to actually become that person first. Nice. And Absolutely. so by becoming that person, we'll end up doing those things so we can have all that stuff. Whether it's money or 
a happy marriage or getting rid of anxiety or whatever it may be. I'm a huge believer in be, do, have Mm -hmm. in that order. And it's so true because the be part is crucial. The be is your character. The be is your identity. The be is the way you see yourself. So people can make environmental changes like move to different places in their lives or, you know, not go to that place that overly concerns them. And they might feel some relief or they could make behavioral changes. They could add skill sets. They could change their values. But if you don't change who you are, your identity, if you don't mold and create who you are as a person, which is the most difficult um, on this path, then nothing changes. If you don't change your identity, nothing changes. If you don't change your character, nothing changes. Um, And in order for that to happen, there are a number of aspects that need to be focused on and we mentioned them in this part in, the, in this episode here, but be do have means, you know, means the ability for you to be conscious enough to understand that your subconscious mind is always taking notes. The law of subconscious mind activity means that in every given moment of every single day of your life, your unconscious mind is taking notes. It's seeing how you're reacting to things. It's even seeing the words that you're expressing to people. So if I go ahead and talk to you and say, yeah, today was a really challenging day. You know, I had these symptoms today and I just couldn't seem to um, get through it. And then this, if I start to talk to you in a more victim like state, your unconscious mind is back there taking notes and forming your identity for you, which brings us to the point of how powerful words are in the creation of your identity. So How do you speak to yourself on a daily basis? How do you speak to other people on a daily basis? You know, what does your body look like on a daily basis from minute to minute? Physiology, what does it look like? These are things that mold the B part, right? The B part. And once the B part is there, the other stuff takes care of itself. It truly does. I mean, you just find things becoming much more easier in your life rather than people telling you that you've got to struggle, that you've got to work very, very hard to accomplish something. These are, these are very misguided in a lot of ways. There doesn't need to be struggle if you can understand how your system works, if you can understand the language that your system understands and therefore create your own identity. You're going to find that it becomes very easy for other parts of your life to to become the way you want it to become. So I know you do a lot of, um, you do a lot of coaching and you do, you help a ton of people, a ton of clients remotely, remotely while you're out there in Bali. Um, how's, how's that going? And, um, how can people reach out to you? Cause I know this is, this has been a phenomenal episode and this is one of those that I'm going to go back and listen to a bunch of times. So I can continue learning from you more than sure. I've already picked up on this. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know anxiety, if I, if I listen, if I listen to this a second, third time around, I know I'm going to pick up on a bunch more stuff. Exactly. Uh, but how can people reach out to you? Uh, come to my website at anxietyexit.com and you'll pick up a free ebook that shares my personal struggles and the achievements in my life, the entire roller coaster ride that was anxiety disorder, where it manifested from what I did. So anxietyexit.com has that as well on iTunes. They can find the anxiety guy podcast there. It's usually doing pretty well in the top 10. So if you look at the chart stuff, you'll be able to run into it and therefore you can subscribe there as well. I've got a nice following on YouTube. You can check out those videos. They come out every Monday and Wednesday. So um, either, yeah, either anxietyexit.com, podcast, or videos. Those are the three mains. And um, you can contact me through anxietyexit.com. I try to answer as many questions as I can and, and be able to create more clarity for someone who's going through some challenges right now in their lives. So uh, that's it. That really is. So, uh, yeah. yeah I, it looks like you get a lot of fulfillment from helping out a ton of people. And it really shows this, through. Yeah, cheers. Because, you know, it's not something that I, I, I'm, I'm conscious of. It's not something that I'm aware of. Like, oh, I'm going to be this happy-go-lucky guy who's just so grateful. Because I, I see a lot of fake stuff out there where, 
oh, you got to find your peace and your white space and your spiritual this and that. And, you know, if I really dig deep into it, these a lot of the information that you find isn't really targeted towards what people truly need. Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, through the information that I'm sending out, it's genuine and people touch on that and feel that. Um, and it does. This is work that picked me. I didn't pick this work at all. If you told me years ago that I'd be doing this and running the podcast and such, I would have laughed at you. So uh, <laughs> it is something that picked me. And a lot of times that's the work, the purpose, the mission that's the most fulfilling. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, um, one last thing. Is there anything we didn't cover here? Actually, I'm going to get to two last things. Before I get to that question, what mm -hmm. advice do you have to somebody who's 20 and somebody who is 40? Mm. Going through anxiety. Going through, or, going through anxiety or um, going through something similar to anxiety. Similar to anxiety. Um, you know, there's always, I would treat both the same. Uh, it doesn't matter to me so much the age group uh, of where they are because the buildup to anxiety and, and mental and emotional challenge are very similar um, in, in many ways. So I would most definitely begin to recognize some of the patterns that I'm running on a daily basis through my thoughts, my words, my actions. And begin to understand, first and foremost, where those came from. Whose thoughts are these? Whose words are these? And whose actions are these? Okay. And I would start with identifying things in the past that have led to this emotional state that you're currently in. So which emotionally traumatic events created this? Because there is a lot of science based around cellular memory. And the memories that we store are not so much stored in our brains, but they're stored in our bodies as well, in the cells of our bodies. Because this is the case now that we've identified the memories and where these patterns have come from, I can now begin to separate myself from the way I think about myself and the world. It's not my thoughts. It's somebody else's and such. So I would begin there. After that, I would begin to create a three-month plan, a, a, a mission for myself to commit to something that has worked for some, someone else, whether that be cognitive behavioral therapy, neuro-linguistic programming, something that has helped somebody else that I know that I've discussed this with, I need to commit three months to that. Before I commit, I need to anticipate the challenges that are going to arise. So, as I'm going through this journey of change, there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. And the downs I will learn from and accept, and the ups I'm not going to spend too much time on because I want to make sure that I stay in this neutral emotional state as much as I can. So I would identify the past. I would take care of the patterns of the present, and I would create a vision for the future that that really fulfills me as a person. And that vision can be things related to materialistic things, or it doesn't have to. It could be related to con contribution. It could be related to being your own boss, whatever it may be, getting back in touch with the vision for your life rather than allowing the world to dictate your vision for you. Because too many people in today's world, and I'm going to go to the present situation. I talked past, present, future. Mm -hmm. The present situation is too many people out in the world are living their lives as if they're leaving their front door open throughout the entire day, allowing anybody and anything to come into their door, to come into their house, meaning their minds. So when you can shut that door, become more conscious, become aware of which thoughts you're entertaining, which not, where your focus is going and that sort of stuff. When you can get to that place, the door is shut, and all of a sudden you are creating the life that you want. You are creating it. You're not following somebody else's path. You're not um, allowing yourself to get caught up in what other people have told you about you and your future. You are in the process, the, the vibration, the momentum of creation. Once this is the case, great things begin to happen to you. But I would, 
I would start with those. I would go to past, I would go to present, and I'd go to future um, for the 20-year-old and the 40-year-old. That's huge. That's huge because, yeah, a lot of those thoughts were like – when somebody was in the third grade and they went up in front of the class and they stumbled over their words, the teacher said, all right, you're not very good at public speaking. And now they mm -hmm. think they're not good at public speaking. And it's not their words, it's their teacher's words. But it sounds it's, like their own yeah. voice in their own head. Exactly. It's the authority figure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Whatever the authority figure says with enough emotion is the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so coming back to that last question is, what's, is there anything we missed that you think would be important to throw out there? You know, I think that um, more than anything, what I would really love for people to get out of this session is to just begin identifying where they're going wrong. As simple as it is. Just recognize where you're going wrong in your life. Ask yourself the question of, whether what I'm about to do or the way I'm about to see this thing is in fact helpful to the molding process, the character development. Is the way I'm thinking about this in fact true for me? And is there enough fact and evidence based around this illusion? And, and I would just begin to focus as much on the subtracting as the addition, meaning subtracting things from your life that don't suit the, the vision for your life and your desires, subtracting the people, subtracting the habits, subtracting the ways of thinking, subtracting where your time is being spent, to take those things out. It's, it's just as important to subtract as it is to add to your life because people are always trying to add and next thing you know, they become overwhelmed because there's so much stuff to do. So more than anything out of this session that we've had, it's just recognize, just recognize um, the people and recognize more so if there are if there are the family, the friends. Notice that although you may be frustrated with those people that are giving you the best piece of advice they can recognize that it's through good intention. They are trying to help you and understand that. Nobody can change you except for you. So make sure that you don't continuously look for things in the external world or other people to try to change you. You're the one that's going to change you based on the information that you're gaining through podcasts such as this one, through YouTube videos and such. And so when you get to a place where you take full responsibility and accountability for where you are in your life and how you're feeling, massive, massive clarity comes to the forefront and once that happens then we can begin to take some action because we are in alignment with what we truly want to manifest in our lives wow that's awesome mm -hmm. thank you um yeah yeah to everybody listening to this reach out to dennis he's he's a phenomenal guy go look up his youtube um we'll put links to everything below in the in the caption section here and uh, I think that's it. I've Good got to stuff. get home. I've got um, my <laughs> wife's. My wife's making dinner, and you just finished up breakfast. I just finished breakfast. It's tea time for me. <laughs> awesome! Right, well, it's been hey, a pleasure. Thank you so much, Nick. It's been phenomenal having you on, and thank you so much, Dennis. Appreciate it, my friend. Yeah. See you soon. Take care. Mm -hmm.